morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Campbell, the director of the TV Festival, and I'd like to welcome you to this morning's panel. This is a hugely important topic that, as our survey reveals, affects so many in the industry. We wanted to provide a forum for debate that's honest and open, reflecting the festival's heritage of tackling contentious issues, but doing so responsibly. This is not about digging for more dirt, but about raising important questions around culture and attitudes in order to affect change and better respect each other. We also hope it will provide some immediate practical support and guidance, especially given the range of expertise that we have on the panel today. A huge thanks to all of them for taking part, to everyone who helped shape this debate with their responses to our survey, as well as ITN and Five News who have supported this event. Sean Williams has been fronting an excellent everyday harassment series for Five News, launched because the Five News team recognise that this is a major issue and want to give a voice to people and empower them to say, that's harassment. That's also our Twitter hashtag today. Highlights from the panel will also feature on this evening's Channel 5 News programme. And we'll be filming the debate to feature on our website and newsletter on Monday. I'm delighted that Sean is bringing her insight to today's discussion and would like to say a very big thanks and over to you, Sean. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to the festival for putting on what Lisa describes a very timely debate, as we all know, because we watch the news and supporting um, the survey that we've done as well. It was trying to get an understanding of what's happening in the television industry, whether the television industry has a culture which supports bullying, sexual harassment, uh, whether it supports those within it if they come forward with claims, how prevalent it is, what's being done about it, and we have some quite shocking statistics which we will reveal to you uh, quite shortly, and also some interesting comments as well about what the industry can do to better protect those uh, who feel threatened doing the job they love, and how we can support them uh, to come forward if they do feel threatened. Um, I want to say as well that you have the chance to pose your questions later on after when the debate finishes. So if you have anything you want to ask, keep it in mind and I'll get to you at the end. And yes, do tweet using the hashtag, that's harassment. I know you'll be annoyed as I am as journalist that it doesn't have an apostrophe. Um, <laughs> that's Twitter for you. <laughs> okay, we've got to go with Twitter. Uh, so do tweet and do think of some questions to ask. Uh, we have an amazing panel and I'm so grateful that they're sharing their time with us today and their expertise. Let me introduce you to them. Uh, Dame Janet Smith is a former Court of Appeal judge who headed the independent review into the BBC's culture and practices uh, during the Jimmy Savile years. Uh, we have Rachel Corp, who's the editor of Five News, the UK's only woman editor of a national news service. Also with us, presenter, producer and journalist Anna Richardson, who brought an action against Arnold Schwarzenegger, alleging a groping incident in a hotel room. Darren Childs is the head of UK TV, the first broadcaster to, mark, uh, to make it into the Sunday Times 100 best companies to work for and Dr. Pina Aphrodite, who's a senior lecturer in psychology who specializes in sexual violence and the emotional impact of that violence and why uh, those who receive it tend not to report it. So before we speak to them and open up the debate to the panel, I uh, just want to remind ourselves of the context of this debate. Let's have a look. It started with Weinstein. It is a growing list, which includes some of Hollywood's most famous. Linking all of these women, their claims that Harvey Weinstein sexually harassed or assaulted them. Actresses are worried that their careers are going to be damaged irrevocably by coming out, speaking out against him. When you and your livelihood are at stake, when your reputation is at stake, when your job is at stake, do you know how scared you are. Why don't you just employ women? We've got masses of brilliant women directors and yet, you know, there's only 7% of Hollywood movies are directed by women. It went to Westminster 
The allegations of a sexual harassment culture at Westminster are disturbing, according to the Speaker of the House of Commons, and demonstrate a need for zero tolerance and also for change. I, I think you and I would agree that sexual harassment will happen you know, on a very regular basis to women in the workplace. I mean, it would be too numerous to, to, to give you an example. Now, allegedly listed are MPs to avoid and even a cabinet minister, yet so far no names have come to light. The cabinet office is urgently investigating reports of specific allegations of misconduct. If someone is made to feel uncomfortable or believes that others have acted inappropriately towards them, they should be able to contact an external, independent, specially trained support team. In reality, it's everywhere, every day. In an exclusive poll, we found that in the past five years, nearly a quarter of women say they had experienced sexual harassment. It was my very first job, and he actually came up to me and like pushed himself against me to kiss me, which was just horrible. It happened several times, but I didn't ever tell anyone about it. He followed me to the bar and I felt somebody put their hand up my skirt. I said, get your hands off me. And his reaction was like, what's your problem? From women of all ages. It just makes me wonder how many other women are there like me who aren't celebrities, they're not out in the public eye, they're just ordinary people like me who've had these things and also who haven't said anything. To students. I feel very vulnerable, very victimised and sometimes I just don't know what to do. Like, I just look to my friends, I'm like, are you experiencing this? Like, am I just, am I overthinking things? And even school children. He inappropriately touched me on my breasts. We were friends, it was really frustrating. I told him to stop and he did it again after. I was really confused about why he thought he could do it, why he wanted to do it, what made him think that he had the right to touch me like that. On social media, because people don't know you, they'll send you pictures of things you don't want to see, of parts of themselves, and it's very disturbing. But now some voices are being heard, and the silence breakers are being heralded. Time magazine's Person of the Year is awarded to those who say, Me Too, who speak out against all harassment. And I think what was interesting about what the editor-in-chief of Time said about why they did that was that... He said, this is the fastest moving social change we've seen in decades. Those voices being heard, something needs to be done. Will it lead to change, though, and what will that change look like? Uh, we'll show you now what people in our industry have been saying. There is uh, an ITN and festival survey. Bullying and harassment at work, 71% experience bullying, 54% experience sexual harassment. It happened within the last five years to 62% of people. 68% didn't report the bullying. 84% did not report the sexual harassment. And those are astonishing figures. Let's uh, talk first to Dame Janet Smith. What do you think of those numbers? Well, I regret to say I'm not surprised by them because they are, uh, they hang together with the information that came my way during the BBC review that I did in respect of Savile, and more particularly the work that <coughs> Dinah Rose QC did for the BBC at the same time that I was doing uh, the Savile review. She did a review into uh, sexual behavior, bullying, intimidation, uh, the culture of fear uh, at the BBC. She dealt with recent years, my review related really to the historical position during Samuel's years at the BBC, and I've, that finished in 2006. In fact, really it finished about 2000. But the evidence all hangs together. Dinah Rose did find that people working at the BBC felt that sexual harassment was a bit less in recent years than it had been. In other words, there was a trend downwards, but it still existed and it was still a problem. But depressingly, she found that bullying had not decreased. And bullying, of course, isn't the same as sexual harassment. I know today we're particularly interested in sexual harassment, but it's related, in my view, to bullying. Bullying can be over all sorts of things, nothing to do with sex. 
usually, of course, of power, I mean, an inequality of power. Is that the relation. common denominator with both bullying and well, sexual harassment? Well, I think it is, yes. Um, it's not, bullying is not, of course, limited to men. Um, you can have woman, a woman <coughs> bullier, a woman bullying another woman, and a woman boss bullying a younger uh, and more junior man. So we're looking at that as well, because I think it's all part and parcel of the same uh, phenomenon of, of disrespect, really. I think disrespect lies uh, underneath all of these things. The other thing that Dinah Rose found, and, and I did too, so this was uh, in the BBC throughout the whole period, and that was the culture of fear, and was the inability to complain about anything, not just about sexual harassment, about bullying, about working conditions, about not being allowed to take a day off, anything. Just the culture of fear that you might lose your job. Um, we like to think, lawyers like to think, particularly lawyers like me who have worked in employment law for many years, like to feel that people have a greater sense of security in their jobs nowadays than they used to in the first half of the 20th century. I'm afraid to say that in the media industry today there, is, there are so many uh, short-term contracts that people feel very insecure indeed and um, it's, very, it, it's also a very overcrowded profession in which you work. And there's always somebody out there just waiting on the doorstep to take your job if you do anything that causes you to give it up. So the culture of fear, and I don't mean I don't physical fear, I mean the culture of losing, fear of losing your job mm -hmm. is prevalent, I think. Um, and again, I think that is part of the problem. That's not part of the, um, the sort of psychological problem. That is an economic problem, I'm afraid. Um, but it is something that also needs to be discussed and tackled. I think we have now reached the situation where we more or less know what the problems are. The real difficulty, to my mind, is what we're going to do about it. Uh, and on that, uh, I think we're going to turn to that later in this we debate. We are, absolutely. But, uh, I mean, we just at the moment want to sort of set out what the industry looks like according to those who got in touch with us. And it's interesting that you <coughs> mention that culture of fear and the insecurity that a lot of people feel. More than a third of the responses came from freelancers. A lot of the responses came from people who work in Indies. But if we bring up the next slide, I think we can probably get an understanding of why people say that they don't report it. So no HR department, that comes from a lot of small Indies. Unsure who to report to, cynicism that nothing will be done. Almost half of the people that contacted us said they were not sure that anything would be done. Um, and actually, a lot of those who got in touch with us said even if they reported it, they weren't happy with the way it was dealt with. Uh, concern about impact on career, 58%, and fear of losing their job, almost 80% of people do not report either bullying or sexual harassment because they're just too frightened to come forward. And, and I wonder, Rachel, how, how we manage that, really, how we change that. Um, it is difficult, and I'll talk about my experiences. I um, joined the industry over 20 years ago, and there, there was a sense as a young woman, I was a trainee, um, that for some men, you were slightly fair game. And um, it was men in a position of power, whether that was through age or seniority or their position within the company. And there were times they felt they could <coughs> sort of launch at you or try to coerce you into something that you didn't want. Um, some of them easier to bat away, some of them slightly more sinister. And uh, it didn't cross my mind to do anything about it, mostly because I was embarrassed and ashamed. There was um, quite a bit of drinking culture. There was a lot of um, going to the pub after work or parties, which, as a young person trying to get on, you, you felt you had to go to. But I, I felt if I reported it, maybe I would have been part of the problem. Um, I think it is really important to mention, as, as you talked about women as well, this was mostly men, but there are women. And perhaps my, my own worst personal experience was from a woman who was senior to me, uh, which really threw me off, because I, I had no parameters to work with at all on that. But um, as Did you report it? I didn't report it. I told one friend, in case something happened to me, one friend within <laughs> the company, but it's, it didn't cross my mind. 
this is some time ago, and uh, I have to say, I, I sort of put that in a section of my life and presumed it was historical, and just um, hoped that wasn't happening. Interestingly, this, this year at, at five, we um, having lots of conversations within the newsroom. We have a very female newsroom and a lot of young women at the start of their careers. And whilst everyone felt very comfortable at work, and it's a very nice newsroom, more and more stories were coming out about um, things that were happening to them in their outside lives, or friends of them on trains, in the street, uh, in bars, in pubs. And, and I was staggered, how much, and all of us were staggered by how every day some of this harassment had become. And again, in all these stories, that there was um, a feeling that couldn't do anything about it, and almost that the woman uh, was the one who had to sort it out for herself, so move train carriages, not go to a certain bar. And we, we felt it was, it was time to perhaps highlight some of this and call it out. And certainly amongst women there was a feeling, actually we're not going to sit on this anymore. We don't necessarily feel we can report it uh, to, the, to the police or to their bosses, but, but they could talk about it. And that's why we launched this campaign that we've talked about. This actually then timed in with all the Weinstein stuff. So it's, it's now mushroomed into this huge area, and it's fantastic that we are now debating it, because yeah. the, the women we've been talking to didn't feel they could. So the, two, the, the big news story coming together with our campaign has elevated to it. But I think that is the question now of what we do about it. And, and it's what people across the UK, I think, are debating and important for us to do. Uh, do you think our industry is complicit in, in accepting it because it's a very, you know, lots of people who, who contact with us say it's unregulated on many levels, there's an inability to have a safe space, it's toxic, there's disgusting behavior. People collectively turn a blind eye to that behavior because it's an environment where cruel, selfish, abusive individuals can do as they please and there isn't enough action from industry leaders. Is there a sense, and perhaps Darren, this is something that you can pick up, is there a sense that the television industry, because of the way it works, because of the pressure of deadlines, because people are thrown together. Because of the talent. And because of the talent. That's a big problem. <laughs> what, that people will not people speak out because they're, they're worried about? Oh, because, because of the reverence that is given to big names. Yes. And, uh, and, uh, and that, that really was a, a toxic element in, in the BBC, uh, which, which I wrote about. Mm. Uh, and I think you, you, have to, you have to include that in your problems that relate specifically to this industry. Yes, because I, because I noticed that from the statistics, you know, more than 60% of people say it's happened in the past five years. Well, I've been in this business for 30 years. And you, you kind of hope that that period has been and gone and we're in a different era. Do you think the industry encourages it or turns a blind eye to it in some sense? I think, it's, uh, I think this is a big leadership challenge. Um, it's not an HR problem, by the way, in my view. This is about leaders in this industry <laughs> taking a stand on whether they think this is acceptable or not. My view is very clear, no one gets away with this, nobody. No talent, no management, no leadership, no one gets away with it. The only way it can be dealt with is if that is the fundamental principle in which you operate and build and manage and lead uh, uh, your company. And it's certainly something that's been very much at the heart of what we've been trying to do at UK TV. So we've made sure that, um, all of those, I mean, 87% of people felt that, that uh, on that survey, the number there, that, that there would be no action. I mean, that's horrific. That's basically saying there is no, there is no rule of law um, in relation to your employment and your protections. And that's, that's a leadership problem that can be dealt with, actually with culture and with systems and with processes. And again, I think, our, certainly my view is great companies, the ones that really are great, have great culture and great people in them. And great people, truly great people, have got a great set of values and they come with that already. Uh, and for me, that's the bit that I think maybe our industry compromises too much on, is that they turn a blind eye to some of that stuff and they shouldn't. Why do they do that, do you think? Uh, I think it's this issue about talent, and I don't think it's just about on-screen talent, I think it's off-screen talent uh, as well. So it's about the power and balance. Yeah. It's about worrying that you won't get the commission or worrying that you won't get the job if you speak out. I think, I think that's right. And, and, and again, we are 100% crystal clear, and we talk about this a lot in our organisation, that if there is an issue of harassment from talent, then the company will back the person that works for us, not the talent. There isn't a single piece of talent, there's not a single rating point that I want in our business 
that is a result of a poisonous culture at all. It's just not an acceptable line. And, and as a company, we will not go there at all. There is no ratings that are high enough to warrant working with someone that can poison and kill the culture which is what's driving your organization's success. So for me, it's a, it's, there's no compromise in this area. Yeah, Anna, um, we, we talked about the number of people who would not report it, who would not speak out because they were frightened. <clears throat> yeah. uh, you very publicly did because you took a case against Arnold Schwarzenegger, which did become a very, very public yeah. uh, case. Why did you feel that you wanted to do that? And were you aware of the possible repercussions to yourself emotionally, to your career? Uh, absolutely. I mean, one thing I want to make very, very clear is that I've um, got a 360-degree view of television. I've worked on every side of the camera. So first things first, I think we need to democratise this a little bit. It's not about talent. It is not about producers. It's about power. Everybody, given the chance, will abuse. So it doesn't matter whether you are talent or a producer. You know, everybody is, is, is liable to behave inappropriately. And I've witnessed it on both sides of the camera. In terms of the Schwarzenegger case, at, at the time I was presenting, I was presenting a film show, there was an alleged groping incident that was very well reported on the day, and it was witnessed, um, and I, and the broadcaster was made uh, very aware that if that story hit the papers, then I wouldn't work again. And as a result of it hitting the papers, I can, um, <coughs> tell you that I didn't work again for quite some time, and uh, I signed on for about So this was months. a case that was settled out of court? Yes, so it, it, it's, 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 it's clear to say that I took the action some time later. I, I sued Schwarzenegger and his aides for libel, yep. because it was alleged that I was lying. Okay. So the only person who was prepared to uh, stand up <coughs> to be in court and say, I witnessed this, was my female producer. <coughs> Every other person that I approached to say, will you go on record to say that you saw this? Because it was well witnessed. Everybody said, don't get involved, don't get involved. And I was told very, very clearly, just suck it out, move on, don't cause trouble, don't cause trouble. So, um, and was there a bit of you that thought, you know what, actually, am I really prepared to do this? Am I really prepared to, to get the flack I'm never no, going to get? No, because by the time I brought the action, I was signing on. I couldn't get a job in television. And you couldn't get a job, you think, because people thought she's a trouble, she's trouble. don't have her on her book. She's trouble, and I'm sick and tired of people who have boundaries and are prepared to stand up and be strong and say, this isn't OK for me. I'm tired of people saying, well, it's not okay because actually this, this this industry preys a little bit on people being compliant, um, and I worry about that. Deeply. I should be able to say it's not all right. So I don't care who you are, it's not okay. So um, by the time that I was, you know, in a really really bad place, uh, my attitude was, I don't care who you are. You're a massive film star. In fact, at the time, he was governor of California, and I just said, I'll see you in court. I have nothing to lose. This was settled in 2006. Has the industry changed subsequently? No. So when all of the allegations came out about Weinstein, I sort of sat at home, metaphorically rolled my eyes and went, here we go again. Absolutely, nobody's learned a thing. I mean, and I was very surprised because actually, in a way, because on Twitter there was this entire storm about Weinstein, you know, and I was thinking, hello, does everybody, has everyone forgotten what happened? you know, a decade ago with Schwarzenegger and the allegations. However, it's very, very important to say, again, that the industry hasn't changed because there is female-on-female -female bullying as well. And some time ago, I was presenting a show, and my female boss said to me, and I will quote this, you have to look fuckable. Now, I'm ashamed to say that I didn't take it to the very, very top. I did take it to some other seniors. And again, it was kind of like, oh, well, you know, I'm not just boss. And I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I didn't take it to the very top. The reason I didn't was because actually I was, I was really worried that um, I would get labelled again as being difficult. So I just I let it go. Does it make you think, why am I still in this industry? At any stage. Well, yeah, that's, that's partly why I've also reframed as a hypnotherapist. Yeah, I've got another career. 
that I can run alongside the sewing industry because it is it can be toxic. Right. So I'm, what I'm interested in is why so many women come forward with these stories, and yet, and and a lot of the bosses are saying we're doing something, and and there are you know HR procedures and hotlines and and yet it still goes on. What is it about that? that I go back to it. What is it that goes that is in the culture of the industry that prevents something? being actively done that prevents Rachel people talking about it. Well, I think that's what, what we need to try and uncover with all of this, and that's what's interesting about the survey. Um, I, I find it desperately sad that a lot of people think there's no point in reporting it. Um, you know, as, as ICN, we have, um, and have had for many years, a zero tolerance of harassment and bullying, and that uh, is communicated to every new employee, it's in all our literature, and part of joining as you know this. Because of everything that was going on uh, with Weinstein and Westminster, we did think it would be a good idea to reissue those. So it's not just people who joined recently, it's everybody throughout the company who knows. But there, there is still a sense that, um, yes, you can report it to your manager, or you can report it to HR, but sometimes that's difficult in itself. Because I, I felt embarrassed when I was younger. So I mean, what, what ITN has now done is launched a hotline run by a third party, which I think is what's key in this. It's just been launched this week, so I can't tell you how it's going. But the idea that actually, if the systems aren't in place <coughs> within the structure, there is someone else you can talk to. And who's not connected with Who's not connected and isn't responsible for your career and your progression. Yep. And, and we'll see what, what comes from that. Dr. Pina, uh, uh, Dr. Aphrodite um, Pina has carried out research into the emotions which drive women not to report. So yeah. you look at sexual violence, and I then you talk to the women or men, I guess, who've experienced that sexual violence and, sure. and seen why they haven't reported it. What do they say to you? Well, I have to say primarily that whatever has been said today is verified in psychological research. Your statistics, your experience, um, the measure that, that you've put in place, all of this is also verified by current research, current and past research. Um, as Anna knows firsthand, and most women would you know, sort of, and, and, and men would know firsthand, the experience of, of harassment and bullying and sexual harassment is a, is a very sort of negative one. And you expect people to feel fear, you expect them to fear uh, ramifications and consequences for their careers and for themselves. What you don't expect, and what I found in my own research, is for them to feel anger. And psychology tells us that, actually, when something is unfair, what you feel is anger. If you are powerless or you feel that you're powerless, then what you experience is fear. So we have a combination within sort of sexual harassment literature that talks about women and the men that this happens to feeling both angry and afraid. You're angry because you know this shouldn't happen to you. You know it's illegal. You know it shouldn't take place. But at the same time, <coughs> if you are, for example, able to do something about it, then this fear is going to drive you on and you're going to react. If uh, this this anger on you, if you on the other hand feel powerless and you don't feel that you have the you know the means to go on, what's going to happen is you're likely going to take a, a route that leads to either avoidance or sometimes denial. So, the research that I've done shows that women and men, predominantly women, I mean I, I say both because it can happen to both, and females are fully capable of, of bullying and, and harassment as well, but. The statistics tell us that it's, it's predominantly a problem that happens to women. So my research reflects that. We found that um, women employ a variety of different sort of coping mechanisms to deal with the aftermath of sexual harassment. And they can vary from sheer denial, that like this is not happening to me. And you'd, you'd be thinking, why would women deny it? It's a strong coping mechanism that helps you go on. If you pretend something's not happening, it may sort of give you that sort of power to go on. Avoidance, you know fully well what's happening, but you don't feel you've got the means to react. Social support um, or talking to other people is the number one coping strategy of all of the people that are involved um, or have been involved in sexual harassment. They tend to want to talk to people that they trust, um, either friends, family members, or sometimes colleagues, but we you know that's, that's a lot less. And then you have the two sort of... Um, we call them sort of aggre aggression sort of tendencies, which means that you're, you're acting, you're coming forward, you're doing something. And that's either talking to the perpetrator themselves, saying, can you please stop? 
Oh, that's a brave thing to do, isn't it? Exactly, and this is why we don't see that very often. And we see it more towards colleagues, people that you feel are on on sort of an equal level to you. You're more likely to say to them, I don't like what you're doing. And then you've got the final coping mechanism of formal reporting. And we know that's roughly around 6% that would go on to formal reporting. I want to bring up a couple of uh, things that came up in our survey in reference Mm -hmm. to what you've been saying. Um, One is a statistic, 78% of people were aware of bullying and sexual harassment to others. Most didn't report it. A quote, there's too much talk and not enough action where it counts and from the industry leaders putting their necks above the parapet and atoning for their part in contributing to this culture. Good luck, I'm leaving the industry. There's no point. So there's, there's two things there. One is it's going on and it may be happening to us, it may be happening to other people, even if it's happening to other people, the majority of people won't do any, anything about it. Mm-hmm. And the second part of that is rather than report it, people will leave the industry, <laughs> which means the perpetrator is still there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. is that something that... That, that is definitely something that, yeah, that, that is verified not only in your industry, but every single industry out there. It's the ramifications are likely to be a lot more serious and a lot more kind of long-standing for the victim than for the perpetrator. The onus is with the victim to prove that something's happened to them. And also, it, it, if they don't feel supported, and obviously all of, the, all of the things that are in place need to be in place, like you know, try, um, knowing that you have an HR department that has specific regulations that you know that you're taking seriously. But if you feel that people are noticing and they're not doing anything, that can still prevent you from coming forward. Because at the same time as being believed by HR, you have to feel believed by your peers as well. Like you have to feel that actually, yes, I support you, this is what's happening to you. And from what I've heard from your experience and other experiences, that's not the case. The the, the support very often isn't there, and don't forget what we were saying earlier on, that we're in a freelance, mainly, industry, and there's always that pressure. I mean, we've all experienced that here, the pressure of, well, somebody else will do it. Mm -hmm. So deal with it. Of those who took it further, Mm -hmm. um, Anna, but there there are people that you've spoken to who have taken it to tribunal. What was the consequence? To, to their career and well, to them emotionally? Most of the experiences that I'm aware of from, from my own research is that people are not pleased with the outcome of tribu- tribunals most often. Because, I mean, one has to understand, it's, it's not the same, I'm not making comparisons, but it's very similar to what would happen in sort of a rape case. The victim has to come forward, they have to report, they need to explain what happened to them, they need to feel believed. But also, they will have to prove, they will have to endure. Even recently, they had to pay a lot of money to go to a tribunal. That's now been abolished. But consider the interim where this would be preventative from people coming forward and reporting. So it's not just financial that cost. It's also, um, you know, psychological. It's, it's, well, it's reputational, isn't it? Because if, if, you, if you step forward and say, this is what's happened, then suddenly your name is at risk. You're the person as a victim that becomes visible. So you're, you stand out automatically. So and despite being the victim, you're the one at the forefront, you're the one everybody The attention is on you. Because that says you're the yes. one causing trouble. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's the, that's the number one fear. People, people, not just women, they often don't want to stand out in situations like these. They don't want to be made to feel like the black sheep. So they will avoid putting themselves in that situation, even if that means putting up with behaviours that they know full well are wrong. I wonder if there's part of it is you're feeling terrible enough anyway, and this is just going to make it worse. And it's that you, you, you've been a victim or something, but then... In, so in some cases it does, work. in your case it did. You lost your job and you didn't, you know, nothing followed afterwards. So the, the, the ramifications, both financial and psychological, were very true to you, and that seems to be the majority of the experiences of people that come forward. I'm not saying... I'm not saying that it doesn't go to tribunals and they, they don't succeed, but even the success, our, our sort of you know, participants say it's bittersweet. Yeah. So I just want to draw your attention, you've seen it, I'm sure uh, this statistic up on the screen, 81% believe reports of sexual harassment were not dealt with satisfactorily, 87% felt reports of bullying 
or not dealt with satisfactorily. Those, obviously, the, the minority of people who did decide to take it further, to talk to their HR department or their line manager, or to get it out into the open, the vast majority believe that it was not handled properly. Is that a time-limited survey, that, that aspect of it, or is that going back uh, over a longish period? Well, from our, in, in terms of the cases that were reported directly to us, 62% yes. um, of those happened in the past five years. Uh, yes, I mean, but in I, connection I mean, with you, this particular statistic, we haven't got, time we haven't got the, 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 the timeline. I mean, no, I, they, they didn't say to us... It's recent. I, mean, I, would, I would like to think that HR practice has improved somewhat in the last few years. Uh, I'm not saying that it's, uh, that it's perfect, but it certainly, certainly isn't. The, the examples that I had uh, from the BBC in the past, and I'm talking about sort of 30 years ago, were unbelievably bad. Like an HR person advising somebody Look, you can carry this complaint further if you wipe it, if, if you if you feel you must. But it won't be a good career move. Mm -hmm. I mean, coming for an HR person, HR person, mm -hmm. person, that is truly shocking. And I, I, I don't think that that would happen in the BBC now. How well they handle things, I don't know. But that, that was BBC 30 years ago. Yeah. So it doesn't the fact that the majority of people who answered our survey say that it happened in the last five years. Uh, they, well, whether they, they reported it or not, but it is still going on. Yes, yes. It is, it is, it is, but there's quite such a huge amount of people who are freelance. I mean, I, I, can, I don't work for a broadcaster, so I can't imagine who I would go to. You should be able to go to the HR department of the company, but not all the, the, the they point they is not to have them, I know. No, in the not all Indies. A lot of Indies got yeah. in touch with us, and they just don't have HR departments. And, and one. One person contacted us to say freelancing keeps people silent because they fear that today's bully is tomorrow's boss. A third of those saying that they were bullied were freelancers, you know, often um, working, uh, going in and out of independent companies, perhaps not sure who their line manager is. Who would they report it to? And if they did report it, would they be called back? One of the things that I would like to know is whether this business of reporting to an independent hotline is working. I, I suspect we don't know yet because I think that it's pretty recent that companies and organisations have started setting uh, this kind of arrangement up. Um, I don't know, Darren, do you have what, what are your procedures if, if somebody comes to you? So we, again, we, we went through this very, in a very thorough and systematic way, because we, for, for me it was important that there was, I needed to make sure there wasn't a part of the organisation where that light couldn't be shown. So there's no way anyone, anyone could hide. And there's a few things you can do, I mean, you know, things around the office environment help in terms of open plans, so you know, you're cutting out that abuse behind closed doors, which cuts bullying down because communication is, uh, um, is overheard, but we have it in a, in a number of different levels. So um, it's difficult for someone who is being bullied or harassed to go to their line manager because the majority of the time it might actually be their line manager that's doing it. So you have to find a way of getting them out of that system and into someone that is independent. And most companies therefore will go to the HR route. But then what happens if the problem's within HR? And, and uh, to hear your stories about the BBC HR team, yeah, a lot of people that are probably in senior roles now and were learning on, on the job when that kind of stuff was happening. They might have been quite junior and kind of working their way through. And a lot of leaders, I think, still continue the practice of things that they saw their bosses do, you know, a generation before. And that's, that's kind of where the lines got to be drawn. So, um, so basically, if you take it to HR, if, if they're not even comfortable taking it to HR, they can bring it directly to me, okay? And if they're not comfortable bringing it to me, so I, there's nowhere I can hide, then actually they can take it to our company secretary who reports it into our shareholders and our board. So there is nowhere anyone can hide in the organisation. So and I think a lot of the, lot of the issues is probably some of the leaders don't hold themselves to a high enough standard of accountability and therefore that's why things kind of fall, fall down I think. So, um, and that's how we deal with it internally. Externally is a little bit harder to control because we're not always on location or on site but we do have people there that that know that part of their job is if they see that kind of behaviour to, to, to report it uh, as well. But we do make everyone that we work with sign up to our standards. Our values aren't for sale at all. Our company values are not for sale 
uh, and we will not compromise them, and therefore we make sure that the third parties that we deal with share the same values as ours. And that includes respect in the workplace and, and some of the things we've been talking about this morning. They're just not acceptable behaviours. Yes. Andrew Litton, on that little, on the clip there, was talking about the problems in Westminster. And in a way, they're very, they're, they're, they're very germane to our discussion today about this industry because um, people are not employed uh, in, in Westminster in the way that they are in a, a, an ordinary corporate body. She talked about setting up an external uh, hotline. And uh, uh, what I really would like to know is whether there's anybody here who has experience of reporting to a wholly independent external hotline. I mean, I absolutely accept what, what you say about um, your desire to establish your values within the company and to have no hiding place. But for the, uh, as, you, as you say, for the external, for, for the freelancer, for the short-term mm -hmm. contract, that may not work. Do we, it, it's being suggested we should have these external hotlines. And I know that there are companies who exist that offer this kind of service, but I don't know how it's working. I want to go to Carl Burnett, <coughs> who, who used to work at BBC, and used to be HR, um, director at News and now works for uh, A&E, which is a big American company. Um, it's sort of okay, isn't it, Carl, for big independent companies to have these in enormous HR departments. Big media companies have big HR departments. They can handle it more easily, can't they? Much more difficult if you are a freelancer, if you're an independent company. It just simply doesn't have the staff and the resources to do it. I think the evidence suggests that having a big HR department doesn't solve the problem either. Um, I, whilst I'd like to reassure you all, I didn't give that advice, um, but, <laughs> but I, I, I would say that um, I've been involved and my team and personally experienced situations where we've not handled those well at all. And, and sadly, I think those people who were brave enough to, to, to raise a concern would definitely have felt like they probably wish they hadn't at the end of it. And I think there's reasons for that. I think um, I think HR HR teams have to represent both the uh, the individuals that are raising a complaint and those people that are being complained about. But it's the so, problem that the HR department is in the it, the very company that's, that's, right. that's, that's, that's effectively causing the problem, perhaps turning a blind eye to That's right. Well. And and I think also the, the the burden of proof. I think there's there's a different burden of proof in employment compared with criminal law. Yeah, I think what organisations often do is they want to absolutely prove that these things have happened. Um, and that zero tolerance point, which I'm <laughs> encouraged to hear Darren talk about, um, it needs to mean zero tolerance. What does because, it mean to you, Zero? Well, it means firing people, and that isn't what happens. Um, I think what often happens is people get moved, and, uh, and that's incredibly... Well, insulting for people. It's that, the victim that gets moved rather than the perpetrator. Yeah, right, that's, that, 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 very often, very often. The, the, the point about independence, I think, is really, really, really important. Um, at the, I was at the BBC when Diane Rose um, continued after after Dame Janet had done her work, and and that was really hard to hear. But what was clear was that people didn't trust the HR department because. They saw the HR department then sit in a room and recruit with the manager, or then sit in a, in a room and train those managers. So, of course, it's inevitable to an extent that they, they, they can feel truly independent. But through the, the um, Diana Rose uh, piece of work, the only, reason, the only way that they surfaced all that information was by having an independent hotline, and it was by running series of workshops that were not run by the HR team, but that were independent organisations that were brought in to do that. And so only that, I think, even surfaced that. I don't think we would have surfaced the, the issue to the extent that we did had it relied on an HR team. Can I mention one feature about the Dyna Rose review, and indeed my own experience, is that people were afraid to be seen to be going to talk to Dinah Rose, uh, and in fact, afraid to be seen that they were coming to give evidence to the Savile Review. Yeah. Uh, they, they wanted assurance of uh, <coughs> anonymity, and that's, that's awful that you can't even go and tell an independent person. No, no. Uh, which, which is worrying. Uh, Rachel. The one thing I wanted to raise, um, I mean, it's fantastic all the HR work that's been done, and I think um, there are a lot of very good leaders out there trying to change culture. One of the things that's always struck me that's been borne out by the survey is how much of our work 
doesn't happen in the office. Mm -hmm. And I think very often a lot of the procedures are um, very good at protecting staff within the office. And you've talked to us about that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, if you look, I don't know if you've got them here, but anyway, a lot of the stats. We do have a, a, a slide, hopefully, that I'm shows sorry, that, I, 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 uh, the, ma the majority, but, um, of, the majority <laughs> of bullying and sexual you the slide. The majority of bullying and sexual harassment uh, takes place in the office, but particularly with um, sexual harassment. About a third of it, I think, we get it. about a third of it takes place outside, outside of the or on, on set, on yeah. location, <laughs> on <laughs> parties, etc. And, I, and that, that's what worries me as, as a manager, that I can put a lot in place and, and a culture. There, there is that peculiar thing about our industry and some other industry where so much happens off premises or away from the, new, the, the norms and the rules that we must put in place. And I think that is a challenge. All of us. I, I wonder whether actually we all, as, as freelancers, most of us, ought to be encouraged to join a union so that we have a, you know, a single union. I'm not even sure who, who it would be. I'm not a member of a union because now I'm talent, in inverted commas. But um, we should be joining a union and say to the broadcasters or the production company or whoever, this isn't, this isn't okay and I'm going to take action. But there's, I feel as though there's nowhere for us to go at the moment, whether that's an independent hotline or not. I feel as though we need more, more power than that. It's, it's I think that's interesting. interesting. A union, independent hotline that's outside organisations, that's perhaps run by an industry body, rather than, I think yeah. that, that certainly seemed to work for, for Deborah. Other people say, a way of reporting that won't cost freelancers their jobs, uh, clearer guidelines and clearer boundaries, an independent person that people can go to with their, with their grievances. Uh, women and men need to feel they can speak out and won't lose their jobs. Um, and, and another comment, there was no system for reporting back the sexual abuse dished out by on-screen talent to run as junior researchers and AP. So uh, no system in place for where they were working, but in terms of what people would like to see, uh, clearer guidelines and clearer boundaries. If we did have an industry-wide set of guidelines, what would they say, Darren? I think it's um, I mean, the industry-wide piece is, is an interesting discussion to have. I noticed this morning that the Academy has just issued their first ever code of conduct uh, for members of the of the, um, uh, the Motion Picture Academy in the States. I haven't read it, so I don't, I don't know what's in it. But it's interesting that you know it's an institution that's probably 70, 80 years old and it's now just started to, to release its code of conduct. Um, and I would imagine most companies have got codes of conduct. But then what happens is leaders turn a Nelson and blind eye to them when they deal with issues. Um, and that, for me, is the bit that's not acceptable. And, you know, if there is a code of conduct, and I'm sure you know, these big organizations have got beautifully crafted, well-written, well-intentioned, well-meaning codes of conduct, but they're useless unless, they lead, unless the leadership enforces them. So you know, a couple of things that we've done which have been very helpful is that we interview on behaviors and values. Before anyone gets in the door, that is a key part of and then we do peer review interviewing as well, so that so that you're making sh we make sure that anyone coming into the building shares our behaviours and our values as an organisation as well, and that really really helps. It also helps with with um, diversity employment as well. That's, an, that's another discussion for another day. Um, so we do that day one. One of the first things we do them on day one is we walk through the harassment, grooming, and bullying. Um, procedures with them as well, so they know. But it's one thing knowing the procedures; it's another thing actually taking that it, it, that step further. That's that's right, and, the, and but they're, they're meaningless unless you unless mm. leaders act. Exactly. So, uh, what do you think, Aphrodite? I mean, uh, how can we how can we change that sort of written down very good guidelines and code of conduct? How can we translate that into behaviour? I think. I'm actually quite impressed by the sort of set of rules that we have. I think this is by far one of the most comprehensive that, I, that I've heard sort of lately. But part of the issue and why I'm so appreciative of this Me Too movement, and I'll, you'll understand in a little why, is that it gave people the freedom to speak about these things. And I think that's the number one issue, is feeling free and able to speak about this, that this actually happened to me and you're believed by people. You're not just a minority, you're actually from the Me Too campaign, you're seeing that actually you are part of the majority. So it's about, we talk about culture, but culture is about people, people make the culture, right? They, they have their own set of stereotypes and their own sets of behaviours and beliefs. So teaching them about what's acceptable is number one. But also it's about them making the work into sort of kind of suppressing their own sort of pre-existing beliefs that don't match 
the sort of institutional beliefs, and that that is unfortunately work that has to happen on the part of the individual. Right. So and that's how the culture needs to change, and there needs to be clear direction from the top as Absolutely. well. One of the things that I've seen so many women in higher positions not take it seriously when it's mentioned purely because they are so used to it. So it goes back really to the original. <laughs> Yes. Point about whether the, the, the culture is complicit in allowing it to continue and whether those people who are in the industry at the very beginning who it happened to a lot and thought, well, this is just part of the job, are not helping the new generation of women and men who are coming through. Yeah, there's a couple of things, obviously, as, as part of our series, which is ongoing, we haven't just highlighted the appalling cases. We've been trying to look at um, some of the initiatives that are going on to uh, try and get rid of this or try and improve things. And, and we've filmed quite a lot around schools or colleges or young people or universities. And there is some fantastic work going on. And it's not just about uh, teaching women how not to get in these situations or how to empower themselves. It's teaching society as a whole where, where the, the parameters of respect are and what you, you can and can't do or should and shouldn't do. Um, but that's not going to help now and where we are. And, and I'm hoping that that... that yeah, in time will work, but we do still, I think, need to do things now. It, it's, I, I'm a mother, and I very much hope, think, when I think about do I want my daughters to go through that, that makes me think, okay, it wasn't okay what happened to me. I, uh, it might not have damaged me, and I might have come out okay, but actually, when you put people in your shoes, do you want that to happen again? No, and I think we do, we have to continue to call it out, but we have to continue to try and make things change. Yeah. Um, can I open this out to the floor? Because I know some of you will have uh, questions that you would like to put to the panel. Um, and I think, sort of moving forward, what would change look like? What would it feel like? How would it enable those of us who have experienced it to feel more comfortable reporting it, knowing that actually we are safe to report it and it will allow us to stay in the industry that we love and the job we love? Um, any questions? Yes, there's, there's one here. Thank you. If you sorry, just say who you are, Tim from Bathurst. I'm sorry, this isn't really a question. I just wanted to say, pick up on the point about the industry-wide guidelines. And we at Bathurst are working with the BFI and other industry organisations to put some guidelines together so that they can be shared across the industry. So, I just okay. wanted anyone who's interested about that. Part. And when, when are you expecting those out? Uh, in February. February. And what do they look like? Do you so know it's based on the ACAS guidelines, and there'll be a code of practice that will kind of sit alongside them, um, which the BFI are putting as part of their. Um, conditions for funding, um, and then there'll be a set of kind of specific recommendations that will be more kind of targeted at the particular crops and grades that where you know, specific issues might arise. Can you give us a, a, an indication of what those recommendations would be, industry-wide recommendations? So the well, the uh, they're based on the ACAS guidelines, which are pretty standard, and they kind of they they're modelled on the, the so law. The conciliation yes. service, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, they'll probably be pretty similar to how they are at the moment. But the recommendations will include things like for, for casting, if you're a casting agent, sending out an actor for a one-to-one -one meeting, you should always offer them a chaperone and things like that. So very specific <coughs> recommendations to tackle the specific issues that come. We just did a two-day's worth of kind of consultation with our members and wider industry to really highlight those is, uh, issues. But we're also committing to doing, and we're asking all the industry bodies to commit to doing training uh, beyond that. So uh, one of the things that's come up through the focus groups is that people don't feel equipped to tackle behaviour, behaviour of their peers. So to, to train people to, to tackle behaviour and to um, address issues as they come up. Um, but you know, we're identifying other kind of training needs throughout that's the process. Interesting. Who's offering that training? Well, we're going to commit to some of it, but we want it to be an industry-wise uh, yeah, commitment. Um, and so I'm also all, we're, we're discussing how to sort of share that out, really. All right, thank you very much for that. It would be really interesting, actually, when that comes forward. I think the training in how you would respond if something happens to you would be fascinating. Have you heard of something like that? No, I haven't. But what depressed me about that is the feeling that you need to send somebody out with a chaperone. Mm -hmm. Um, in, 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 in a working situation, I mean, it, it, that's really depressing, isn't it? I'm not saying it shouldn't happen. If it's really necessary, then it should okay. be offered. It's the but, recommendation but, that it should be offered if somebody feels that they yes, want to. Yeah, um, that, that is depressing. Yes. Now, I, uh, training is always good, but it isn't always a total answer. Mm -hmm. But it's is the there to do. Well, no, because uh, well, not a total answer, but there are. There are things that you can do, and I, I, I think probably what the industry has to do, and society as a whole, is to, ha is to have a collection of steps which all together will contribute to a changing culture. I don't think we're ever going to get rid of 
the, ki the kind of lack of respect um, which underlies all of this, both bullying and sexual violence. <coughs> Part of it is human nature, but you can gradually, by steps in education and training and preventive measures to gradually shift, and discussion, terribly important, making making things unacceptable that people had uh, thought were okay, uh, I think you can gradually shift the culture. But it's a long job. I don't expect it to be all right by next year. <laughs> That does sound depressing, though. No, uh, well, I, th I think uh, I, I'm very old, and I have witnessed a number of changes in culture for for the best, for the better, but they come about very gradually. And I think that's, I, you know, human nature. But you can, you can encourage that change. Oh, yes, in by lots of different ways. By recognising that lack of respect that currently exists yes. and saying, this will not do and I will call it out. I was just going to counter that, Dan, and I'll, I hope that everybody agrees here that I really think we can change that culture. Well, I think we can, but I don't think tomorrow. No, <laughs> uh, maybe what, I, I would hope that within the next sort of 12 to 24 months, I would hope that as an industry, we're not that big an industry in the UK, as an industry within broadcasting, we can stand up and say, as you were saying, this is not acceptable. Everyone's accountable. Does everybody here feel that things can move in the next 12 months? Yeah. I see some hands raised. Who thinks that things, now we've got the debate going and now we're hearing the voices, things can change? Can I see some hands raised if you do? And those who are less confident? It's, it's about an, it's it's an equal split, split, really. It's an equal split. Anybody else got any good suggestions about what we might be able to do as an industry to help ourselves? Yes, there's a question down here, if we can run a mic down here. Again, if you could just say who you are and where you come from, or you could... Oh, thank you. <laughs> Better be good now. Oh, one, two, <laughs> um, my name's Sally. My uh, business I set up a, a year ago, Limelight HR, basically to support small businesses that aren't big enough to have their own HR department, because I feel really strongly that there is that support needed. Uh, for me, and some of what we've talked about here that's important is we talk a lot about process and uh, putting in processes and documents and guidelines and actually there's a whole load of work that needs to be done outside of that because people are more important than process and you can have as many documents as you like but if people don't understand them, feel that they've got the trust in the organisation, they won't do anything with them and you can have uh, the steps up to, if you don't trust HR, go to the next person, go to the next person. If somebody's in a very difficult situation, the chance of them <laughs> having the, the nerve and the steel to, to go through that process. So maybe something around having colleagues within an organization which are the trusted people uh, who have been maybe picked by the organization to say, we, we trust them and we will go to them as an independent person. So they're still in the organization, but they're not somebody who maybe uh, would be distrusted. Um, and, and also just about um, trying to find ways to make people feel more that they trust people because it, it's about having somebody you go to that you believe will believe you. Um, that's where I listen to. Yeah, I've, I've had to sit with people who have cried for days before they've been willing to put their uh, grievance in and it's only at the point where they really trusted that I was going to Hand, hold their hand through that process that they did it and we took the action that we needed and we did sack the people that needed to be sacked but unless somebody feels that somebody's going to hold their hand through that process and they really trust that person they are not going to come forward so whether that's a leader or an HR person it, it's about the trust not about the fact that the policy exists. And can that be done within a very small independent company as, as, as much as a big company which has the resources to support it. Absolutely, as long as the person that runs or owns the business and can make those decisions actually cares about people and doing what's right. If they're a values-led organisation, then the value should be more important than uh, following a process or being scared of being taken to a tribunal. It's not about risk, it's about people Absolutely. and your values. It's about values? Yeah. Aphrodite, you wanted to speak up. Yeah, it's right? also about understanding what the process actually is. Because lots of us are talking about putting, you know, sort of processes in place that, that victims can come forward. But you, you find, from asking them, the majority of them don't really know what the process entails. 
They know that they have certain people that they can go and talk to, but what happens afterwards is a mystery mm. to most people. So that's why your hand-holding sort of, you know, service that you provide is so important. Because when somebody realizes that it doesn't really stop here, you have to take it forward. You may sit, if your case is good enough, you may sit in a tribunal. You may need to explain it. These things are not often explained in full to the, the, to the sort of, you know, to people that has, this has happened to. And I think that's important. Okay. Yes, this question here. Can you just pass the microphone back? Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Olivia Hetfield. I'm the president of the Writers Guild, um, so which is one of the unions to which uh, you refer on. Uh, we too have been part of this debate, and particularly obviously talking about it from the writer's point of view. Um, there are a couple of points I wanted to pick up on. One was that I understood that the BBC, in the light of um, Dane Janet's work and the Rose Review, did indeed bring in um, an independent um, service. and. Um, they ran it for a year and it cost over £100,000 um, and so it was deemed simply too expensive to continue. Um, it just wasn't too busy <laughs> to speak to that. But it's now being dealt with on an ad hoc basis rather than having a permanently instituted um, independent voice. Although they still have the, the employee assistance programme, don't they? So they still yes, they have, but this was a separate thing. thing. This was a separate thing, yeah. Um, I think it's enormously important to model good behaviour, not just to say that you have a code of conduct, not to say even zero tolerance, but to go, actually, this is the right way to behave. One of the things that I found most shocking from our conversation a few days ago was that we had recent graduates and film students talking to us who said, on the set of my student film, there were people bullying each other and there were people behaving inappropriately, and nobody from the staff of the organisation said, you shouldn't behave like this, and they felt that they were behaving as a director ought to behave, or as a producer ought to behave, because that's what they had learned from the it's, it's almost, it's almost like parenting, isn't it? It's yeah. sort of like, you know, we should be acting as, as more big family and, and good parents. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you, but it's about <coughs> setting an example. And so I, we talked about values. It's about setting an example. This is the correct way. And I think one of the things that we can do as part of this conversation is actually celebrate the good things. It's often, it's very easy to only look at the bad things, but actually there are frequently very good examples of good management and uh, people working together in a very positive way. Um, and it's useful to, to celebrate that as well. No, I'm sure sure I'm a small one. Um, sorry, sorry, one, one, I was just going to say, perhaps that ought to be recognised and celebrated more. As you say, perhaps there should be an award, perhaps there should be you know, public recognition. I know there are some, yes. Sorry, um, um, I wasn't committing to my question. Um, I think probably answered it already, but I've really enjoyed listening to the discussion. I think everyone's spoken really eloquently, and it's very interesting to hear people's points of view. Um, I think obviously there's so many different facets to it, but I just think it's worth talking again a little bit about um, this sort of constant pandering to talent. Um, I am an actor myself, and, um, <laughs> but um, you know I've definitely witnessed um, some incredibly um, <laughs> disgusting display of disrespect from quite high profile um, A list. High profile yeah. A list, I can speak as low profile Z list. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. I've absolutely suffered yeah. bullying from production. Yeah. So I think we have to be clear, and this is what I was saying at the very, very beginning it's not about talent. It's about people at the top, whether they, be they broadcasters, producers, or talent, people at the top who think they are entitled and can bully. It's about power. Of course, of course. But I feel it, it, it just, I feel very cynical against that, that it is, this is so easy to change for, for the person who's been hired because they're going to sell the film or they're going to sell the piece or whatever. I feel very cynical that, you know, I'm sure House of Cards didn't really want to shut down their production. It's just that was the last resort they had to come to. They should have done that much sooner. You know, that, you know, it's like, it's all about money, really, at the end of the day. And that's a real problem. And it is a problem how much actors, especially high profile actors, are pandered to. And it gives them an opportunity to disrespect people. But then we're talking about values again, aren't we? Yeah, it is values, yeah. Stand up and say, do you know what, I don't care who you are. Yeah. It's not okay. And yeah. the, the culture within this production, or this film, or this production company, 
is that we set examples of good behaviour. Yeah, totally, and I don't feel like the pressure should... do something similar. Like John Oliver basically stood up to yeah. Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. everyone, everyone, and this kind of is indicative of our, of our culture, everyone just went like, really? To Dustin Hoffman? But he did. And it came from a man, and this is why it was really important, because he didn't let go. When that apology was not really an apology, what he did is he, he basically told them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about dealing exactly. with a lack of respect wherever it comes yes. from. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. But also, so in that saying, situation. If it, if it does come from somebody who is a talent, who is yeah. meant to be selling your, you just, you, you get shot because that is the message you need to send. Is, to is your talent and quality and values for sale? Because that's basically, the, that's the trade-off you're making. You're saying, this piece of talent is so big, I will destroy my entire organisation in order to work with them. And, mm -hmm. I, I, and that is just a, a bizarre executive decision to make with anybody. No one's as big as... I was just going to say, just to tell you that I do think still in that situation, John Oliver would probably feel much less disposable than someone else Absolutely. in this situation. So it's I kind of not as easy for him to do that. And that's but why. It's, you know, yeah, that's and I'm not saying it's about power, and it's about feeling that you have the power to do that. But if everybody, if as a talent yourself, I think you have a responsibility to, if you it's, see that, to name it. This Exactly. This slightly drives me sort of insane, because the one message that we should be you know, everybody should be taken away from today is everybody has the yeah. power yeah. and the ability and the self-respect to stand up and say no. No one gets away with it. No. no one gets away with it. Um, we are going on a little longer than, than Bill, so thank you for, for your <laughs> for contributing to this and thank you for your questions. We've got just have we got time for a couple more? We're here until we can have the room until twelve, can't we? If everybody is okay, can we just get a couple of short ones? Yes. Susan. <laughs> yeah, but you told us about the consequences of doing that. And you yeah, said that, that I think I, I'm hoping that now, especially with the Weinstein situation, especially <laughs> with what we've talked about today, that actually if you're not being listened to at the very, very top, then you make them listen and you take legal action. It's not okay. Because what's your alternative? Maybe the environment as well is different now. To well, it was. Yes. Well, there, there is an alternative, and, and one of the questioners up there um, described going to an organisation, I don't think he gave us the name of it, but there is an organisation called Public Concern at Work, which was initially set up to help people who wanted to blow a whistle, usually about uh, dishonesty or something like that that was going on in their company and they didn't dare to report it. But actually Public Concern at Work will help uh, in other kinds of situations and I, I, I'm sure we'll find on their website, PCAW, Public Concern at Work. I don't have shares, I do assure you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think that that is an outside organization, exists primarily for whistleblowing, but actually what you're talking about is a form of whistleblowing. And I think that they would um, they, they would be a, a case where you could you could turn to. Can, well, sorry, can I yes. just say as well, if, if anybody here doesn't know what to do and wants to speak to somebody in confidence, I'm happy to have a chat. It's Limelight yeah, HR, the Sally. Line is, the La, Limelight HR, Limelight. Sally Benson. Get in touch. Like, obviously, I'm not talking costs involved. Just for free, have a conversation about Thank what you. you could do. Thank you. We're happy to help. I, I think we've heard some really, uh, I mean, amid all the doom and gloom, we've heard some quite positive things about change and about what things that are in place to enable people to talk about it, to enable the culture to shift, to make us realise that there needs to be this respect at work which comes right at the top, right at the bottom, and fed all the way through. Thank you so much for participating. I'd like to thank our panel, and I think it would be extraordinary.